Yeah. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm Sophie. I think I've met a lot of you guys. I'm going to be talking about sort of advanced or next level goals of care, actually mostly in the outpatient setting. Um, all right, so I have no financial disclosures, uh, just the normal contact, uh, context expertise disclosure that like, I'm really not an expert in this. This is something that I was kind of inspired to delve more into because I actually felt like I was uh, pretty not knowledgeable. So hopefully I'm a little bit more knowledgeable than I was, but I'm definitely not an expert. Okay. Um, and before we get started, I'm gonna introduce you to one of my patients. And I'm also have a few people who've agreed to chat with me during my presentation. So it's less of a monologue. So Anaya and Tinny and Leah are gonna be my highlighted people. And I want like everybody to jump in if they have questions or thoughts. I would really prefer that this is interactive, but those three people have generously agreed to like chat with me a little bit more. So I especially want you guys to jump in and chat and have questions or comments and feel really free to interrupt me. All right, so Mr. Atz is one of my 81 year old patients that I took care of in clinic. He was actually one of the patients that was signed out to me by the former resident taking care of him as like a high risk patient. Um, and this was sort of the story, his story. So in January of 2021, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. This was sort of a delayed diagnosis from someone who previously declined lung cancer screening. Um, in March of that year, he declined surgery, which would have been curative at that time, um, but had a strong preference for not proceeding ahead with surgery. In June of 2021, he began radiation. This is right when I start residency. So this is like me as an intern getting signed out about this patient, just being like, oh my gosh, what's going on? How am I going to help this just gentleman? In sort of disappears. He's like a little bit off my radar. He's well engaged with Ankh. In January of this year, he has disease reoccurrence. So despite the radiation, he's had recurrence of his cancer. And then in May, I'm like poking through his chart. I'm like reviewing things. I see that he's at this life-saving treatment note in the VA system um, where basically his goals of care and like what he's hoping from his cancer treatment are like really not aligned with what the oncology team is hoping to offer him. In June, he has a palliative care appointment, like reading between the lines, I think he was referred to the palliative care because there's this whole question of like, what's going on? Like, how are we managing this gentleman's cancer diagnosis? And then in July, 2022, he's admitted to the hospital, to a community hospital with sepsis, probably as a consequence of um, some of the cancer therapies he's undergoing at this time. And then, oops, I can't quite see, uh, in, uh, August of 2022, he has his like PCP annual visit with me. And like, he just pops up on my schedule and like, I haven't, I'd seen this guy like once, like a year ago. And then he like, just is like scheduled and it's like annual visit. And I was like, oh my goodness, what should I even start doing? I'm wondering if Anaya or Leah or Tinny or if anyone else has any like thoughts, like how would you approach this, this random 30 minute visit that you have with this patient who's had this like whole cancer odyssey? I think something that just like is coming into my head right now is like there again, it's been um, an odyssey for him. And like, he, I really just from looking at this timeline, wouldn't know how he feels or what he knows or where, where he is. And so trying to like come into the appointment and like wash myself of all preconceptions before the appointment and just be like there to like, basically have no expectations of the appointment, but just like be there for information gathering. I think that's such a good point. I think it'd be like really easy to look at this timeline or like look at this in the EMR and be like, have like some big judgments about what's going on. But I totally agree. I think that was one of, I spent a long time thinking about the appointment in the end. I was like, I really don't know how he feels about his healthcare. If he's like really pleased or displeased, like if he feels like we're doing a good job or a bad job. That was definitely like one of my big goals, which is to do some like information gathering of like, how does he feel like things are going? Tinny, do you have any like additional thoughts? I, I feel like you've got a similar patient panel at the VA. So I wonder if you've run across any like similar experiences. Um, I think one of the other things is to kind of ask him if there's anybody else that he would like to have this conversation with. And if you kind of know that that appointment's coming up to have your um, nurse care manager or MSA call and see if the appointment can be made with whoever he wants to share this with so that you can have a shared decision making process. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And as I got to know this guy better, I realized that like his wife was super important to him. Um, I think that's something I did a hint of before this, but yeah, I, being like more proactive about reaching out. Anyone else have any other thoughts? Okay. Um, I was going to say like, I think it's less, maybe less so at the VA, but like sometimes when you see an annual on your schedule, um, at least for me, that can be like, oh no, like we're not going to be able to do all these things. It's an annual, but like, honestly, you can like, we, you can like wipe clean the agenda and do exactly like what Ananya was saying for any visit, as long as you get buy-in from the patient. Yeah, I agree. I think just like having a clean slate and recognizing for me that this patient was like very medically complicated and there was a lot going on and that I was just gonna have to use some like basic information gathering of like how they felt like things, how he felt like things were going and like what was working well in his healthcare and what wasn't. Um, yeah, thank you all. Let's see. All right, so here are the objectives of my talk. So the first chunk, so objective one, is basically going to be exploring this patient priorities care framework, which is an outpatient framework for essentially goals of care planning and sort of like big picture shifting people's healthcare to be more aligned with their priorities in an outpatient setting. It was something that I had never used before kind of like embarking on this project with this patient and um, learning more about it. So I want you guys to be familiar with this. I'm going to spend a really short amount of time talking about the REMAP framework, REMAP framework, which is something that's used in the inpatient setting. Part of the reason why I'm not gonna spend very much time is it's, I think a little bit more familiar to a lot of us and the R3s actually have just in time training at the Montlake campus on this. So I, I don't wanna be repetitive. And I think a lot of us feel more equipped to have these conversations in the inpatient setting rather than the outpatient setting. And then I'm gonna open up some time to talk about, uh, talk about these questions in small groups. Um, I think like it took a lot of me thinking about this and like chatting with peers and chatting with attendings that I trusted to, I don't know, that was very useful for me. So I want to like set aside some time for that, especially because this is sort of a, a light informational session. I'm really just trying to introduce you to some tools that I think are helpful. All right. So this is my outline. So we've done the intro. Um, I'm going to talk for a while about this model called patient priorities care, which is again, kind of like an outpatient model that can be used in clinic. I'm going to like really speedily run through the remap framework. Um, honestly, basically just my goal is to like, have you remember this term so you can Google it if you're feeling overwhelmed in the inpatient setting and you wanna like remind yourself of a useful inpatient uh, framework. We're gonna have some time for small group discussion and then some time for summary. I'm not gonna, I'll remind you of this as we get closer, but I'm not gonna actually ask you guys to report out in small group discussion unless you have things that you want to share. Um, which I would be really curious to, to hear about, but no required reporting out. All right, so the majority of my talk is gonna be about this clinic model, so like an outpatient model called patient priorities care. It's one that one of the attendings at the VA suggested I use when I was kind of grappling with um, a patient whose care I felt like was kind of going off the rails and I wasn't sure like what we were doing that was helpful and what we were doing that was burdensome. Um, and I will introduce you to it, introduce you to the steps. Um, shortly. All right. So like, I think big picture, like what should this patient, Mr. S and I like focus on during this annual visit? I feel like I already gotten some useful hints. Leah said sort of like wiping the slate clean, kind of, you know, approaching this from blank slate, just like listening to what the patient wants to focus on. I'm wondering if anyone else has like any other ideas, for like what I should be focusing on during this clinic visit, either in the chat or feel free to chime in. I think it'd be helpful to kind of get a sense of who he is and like a little bit of social history as well as his like baseline, like medical literacy um, yeah. that can kind of help you out. I totally agree. Like, who is this patient? How is he thinking about his medical care? What is like the social context that he exists in? Any other thoughts? Code status, advanced care planning stuff. Yeah, that would definitely be helpful. Um, I didn't delve into this, but this is someone who there were like, there was like a very brief life-sustaining treatment note from his oncologist that I was getting the strong vibe that like the oncologist was really not pleased about how the cold status conversation had gone. And it was like full code, do everything, even this guy with like metastatic recurrent cancer. So that was definitely something on my mind where I was like, oh man, if, if I could even start to get at that, that would be really high yield. Thank you, Kristen. Um, any 
Any other ideas? Can I just point out really quickly that there's oftentimes like this fear that this patient is gonna like land in the hospital between like you seeing him and the next time you're seeing him and this like rush to get a code status in during one visit, which I don't know is really sustainable or practical because it would take more than 30 minutes in the inpatient side to have a goals of care meeting. They're often like an hour. So I just feel like that's something to have in the back of your head that like this is, it's scary, but you know, it's gonna take more than one visit. And then um, this kind of fits into social history, but as well as goals of care, but like just naming functional status, like what can he do? What does he want to do? Um, oh, did we lose Sophie? <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. Well, it's going to be extra challenge for me. So thanks everyone for bearing with me. I actually want you guys to talk now because uh, I'm not going to be able to see the chat. Um, but just to recap, when we left off, uh, Timmy and Leanne and Aya and Kristen have all brought up kind of good thoughts about like what should, what should we focus on clinic, kind of doing some basic social history gathering, trying to get a better sense of the patient and kind of who he is and how self-care is or is not working. All right, can we go forward a slide? Yes. All right, I'm going to assume we're forward one slide. We are, yes. So the framework that I'm going to talk about today is called Patient Priorities Care. It's basically a structured interview format. It takes from 30 to, it was, Uh oh, so he's on so far, which is the reason I chose to um, use him as my example. The target population is kind of patients with multiple health conditions, but not clearly at the end of life, so a little bit different than my guy. And kind of specific uh, uh, set of patients that this was initially tested with was patients with kind of polypharmacy and kind of a number of chronic conditions, or kind of people who were running around seeing a bunch of specialists and thought was like, how can we? help these people improve their healthcare and make it so it's more aligned with their goals. In terms of the underlying uh, philosophy beyond behind this uh, interview format is you're trying to elicit patients kind of values and prioritize um, the care that makes sense to them. So the things that they, the types of care they're receiving that they find high yield and valuable. Um, and the way you do that is sort of exploring their goals, their values, and trying to identify specific ways in which you could improve their care. And finally, kind of the goal is to sort of match what medications and care aligns with their kind of think about maybe what's extra, what's superfluous, and then what could be added. So the goal is not necessarily to discontinue care, but to kind of reprioritize the care that you're focusing on. Let's go forward one slide, so one click. Um, and we should be seeing sort of lays out graphically what I said, which is to be this continuous process, kind of talking to patients figuring out what care makes sense, adding in more care that uh, the patient finds valuable, and then taking away care maybe they find onerous or superfluous or isn't providing them um, much value. And then you're supposed to be kind of reevaluating the impact of those changes. So you're not supposed to do it in a vacuum. All right, let's go forward one slide. Um, so now introducing a white slide with a bunch of blue arrows at the bottom. This is, these are the steps of um, the conversation. So each of these arrows is sort of one piece of that conversation and it moves from left to right. Um, and so the, the thing you're supposed to start with, which is a question. So it felt intimidating to me when I first learned about it, sort of like what matters most. You can click forward one. Now we'll have a green circle. And these are supposed to be different domains of like what maybe could bring a patient's enjoyment. So kind of the top left, we have connecting. So these are patients that are motivated or elements of an individual patient's life that are kind of focused on connecting to other people, so like family, community, spirituality. There's this kind of nebulous bucket on the top right of enjoying life. Bottom right, you sort of have this area where it's supposed to be 
kind of patient's preference for autonomy, so functioning, dignity, and independence. And then bottom left, is sort of preferences around how they want to manage their health. Um, these are like huge buckets. And when I first learned about these, and when I first saw them, I was super duper intimidated. Um, I'm wondering, very hard, I can't see who might want to contribute. Did you guys have any thoughts that you could ask to try to uh, kind of elicit what patients think about kind of different, um, these different buckets? Can I make you pick kind of like a bucket to talk about? Um, sure. Um, I guess I'll talk about the connecting family, community, and spirituality. Um, and I guess this is just very generic, but sometimes I ask, like, is religion important to you? Like, do you, is there something that you do with your family that you enjoy doing? Stuff like that. Um, yeah. That is like a really great place to start. Like who are the important people in your life and what does connecting with those people look like to you? And maybe what are the limitations that are you know, keeping you from doing that more? Leah or Anaya, would you mind giving me a question for one of the other buckets? Yeah, I don't know which bucket this um, would fit into, but one question I feel like I, I've also used is like, um when you wake up in the morning what what do you look forward to doing um and then earlier we had a conversation about a question for like the enjoying life bucket um that I've also used which is what gives you joy or more often with patients family members in the inpatient setting what gives what do you think brings joy to this patient yeah I feel like when we're in the inpatient setting we're like we kind of frame it as like, what could this person not live without? Or um, like, what are kind of like the central things that are so important to this patient, but a quality of life that didn't include this would not be worth living. But I agree, just like, sort of what do you enjoy? What does a good day look like for you? I think those can be helpful. Um, maybe I can ask Leah or Eric, I know you guys are both on here, if you have any thoughts on the managing health or the functioning dignity and independence kind of buckets of things. Yeah, this is Leah. Um, I don't, you know, in truth, I think these are harder for me to ask because um, they can feel yeah. more accusatory. So I'll just name that. Um, I Thank also you. note that I'm in Falls Clinic right now, or I have been for my Jerry rotation. And just like, I think the scale of one to 10 can be helpful here. Like um, as far mm. as your independence, like how would you rate that on a scale of one to 10? And then once I get them talking, one thing I, I do like to ask is, is there anything that you want to be able to do that you cannot? Um, and that oftentimes they're like, they're like, absolutely not. Like I can do everything that I want and need to do. And they're like, okay, well, what does that look like? And then if they say, yes, actually it's blank, then that can help um, kind of align their perspective as well. Thanks, Leah. I really like that phrasing of like, what do you want to do right now that maybe you can't do? A lot of this framework is kind of trying to get at that. Like, what is, what would be meaningful you do that maybe we could get you back to? Like, what, what is like a goal we could build you to? Um, so can we go, can you click forward one, Sarah, and then we'll see a bunch of examples of questions pop up that are kind of getting at what Leah and Tini and Anaya all brought up. So these are just like sample questions that you could ask. Um, one we didn't talk about very much is the managing health bucket, because I agree with Leah, I think it's a tricky one to ask about. Um, but I like the first question this year, what do you hope your healthcare can do for you? I think that's a really helpful one to ask sometimes, kind of like trying to align with, or trying to figure out like kind of what the patient is hoping to get out of our healthcare, whether it's better symptom control or longevity or something else, I think that can be helpful. All right, so this is sort of like where you start the conversation where you're trying to kind of get a sense of what is important to the patient kind of in these different domains of life. And I think, you know, asking kind of thorough questions on all of these domains would definitely take the entire interview. The goal is not to do that. The goal is just to kind of get, get a sense. And for some people, they'll have one bucket that's sort of a clear focus on kind of how they want to 
focus their healthcare. Um, let's click forward one more. So now we should have a little old gentleman um, who's representing my patient. And then if you click forward one more, Sarah, um, you see kind of his answer pops up. And he was actually, my patient was like really clear in his answer. He really, his main goal kind of like what mattered most was this project of family uh, unification. And he wanted to help his wife get her children to Nigeria, which was sort of this like massive project that they've been working on for a number of years. All right, let's click forward one more time. So the second kind of place you're supposed to take the conversation is you have to have that sort of abstract goal and then kind of refocus it into a health-related goal that maybe you're able to work on with the patient. So there are kind of examples up here. Um, so sort of like Julia's point of maybe getting a patient back to doing something that they want to be able to do. You know, so on the top left, we have an example of the goal is like, I want to be strong enough to walk with my grandchildren to do once a week. And then sort of in the enjoying health bucket, uh, I'm sorry, the enjoying life bucket, maybe there's someone who like wants to be able to go out and like have more fun maybe in what they eat without checking their blood sugars, that sort of thing. Uh, and then see different examples of different goals. So this is like the second step in the conversation is trying to come up with a specific goal that you can focus on with a patient. All right, let's click forward one more. Um, and now we see my little elderly patient. And kind of his most important health goal was he wanted to stop uh, losing weight so to keep up his strength and help out his wife. And he wanted to keep sharp. So he wanted to like, do the big napper during the day. He wanted to stop doing that. Um, so he was sort of alert and awake and able to help her with her paperwork. All right, let's click forward one more. So next place is just to take the conversation and sort of most bothersome symptoms. I'm wondering if anyone has any helpful language that they might use to try to elicit, like, what are the symptoms that are bothering your patients the most in their day-to-day -day life? I like the phrase, yeah. if I could take away, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, sorry, keep um, going, Jenny. Um, I like the phrase, um, if I could take away one symptom, to improve your quality of life, which one would it be? Yeah, I really like that one too. And that's one I actually wasn't aware of as a phrasing until I started looking into this framework, but I like that one. Any other ones? You can also read it in the chat and then, sorry, write it in the chat and maybe I can ask Sarah to read it out if we have any good ones in the chat. Yeah, Sophie, so Wes asks, um, he, he throws in a couple of questions. What does a good day look like? What does a bad day look like? I think those are great ones, Wes, and especially if you can kind of get at a particular, maybe like sticking point, like maybe the person like has a lot of pain in their knees and that's preventing them from like walking around, which is a goal or something like that. Any other ways you guys like to phrase this? Those are all great. Let's click forward one and then we'll just see a list of like examples of how you could ask question. The second one is sort of this framing that Kimmy was suggesting, so like what would you get rid of if you can have the ability to do. I like the third one here where you're trying to basically elicit um, maybe things that you've missed, like maybe the patient has a particular body and symptom that they feel like their healthcare team or their doctors just really don't know about or like don't understand well. This one has been really helpful for me. And then the fourth one kind of gets that that point Leah made earlier of like why aren't you able to maybe do the things that you find meaningful or the things that you most want to do? Here's a list. Let's click forward one. So we should be seeing my little elderly patient, Mr. S. And his main complaint, um, if I click forward one more, there's like a speech stop bubble that pops up. His main complaint was that he just felt really skinny and weak and couldn't enjoy meals with his wife, which is like a big, Sadness for him. He really enjoyed the cooking. All right, let's click forward one more. So now we should be on helpful care. So that should be in bright blue at the bottom of the screen. Um, does anyone have any good ways they like to frame kind of like what care you're giving to the patient that maybe they find helpful? Any thoughts? Any ways you guys would know about with patients? Oh, 
That's okay. All right, just click forward one more, and we'll just give you kind of a, a list. I think it's hard to sometimes the assumption, at least in my mind going into this, is like you assume that a lot of the care you're providing maybe is helpful, like you kind of focus on the benefits, or maybe that's the consumption that I need. Um, but I like this list, of like what's working well for you. And I thought about the third one was interesting, like what appointments you look forward to going to. So just like on an effective level, kind of what parts of your healthcare are bringing you joy in a day-to-day -day life. All right, and then clicking for it further, we have burdensome care. Oops, sorry. If you click one forward, you see my little patient, Mr. S. If you click forward, you can see that he thought it was particularly important that he got his oxycodone for his metastatic cancer. It's obviously important. And I was also really shocked to hear that you liked coming to his primary care visits. We had a couple of them at this point when I sort of reevaluated how things were going and implemented this new framework. And I think my bias is I was like, man, I feel like we're like really not doing very much of these visits. And you seem like they're a lot of your time and you don't live real close. Um, but I was surprised to hear that he really enjoyed coming to see me, which was a nice surprise. Um, he thought it was like useful that I was sort of like keeping an eye on how his health was going big picture. And then he also brought up that the social worker he's been connected to, uh, connected to you through oncology clinic was really helpful. And this was something that was like really helpful for me to hear. Um, because it let me reach back out to her and kind of encourage her to continue following up with him. So I hadn't realized that was such a big thing that was helpful to him. All right. And if we click forward one more, we should have burdensome care highlighted in bright blue at the bottom of the screen. So in this part of the interview, your goal is to sort of elicit from the patient what parts of their healthcare they find burdensome or onerous or not especially useful. And if we click forward, We'll see a bunch of pills on the top left. So like for a lot of patients, you know, poly polypharmacy can be a big issue. And this was sort of um, one of the original things that they were interested in the study population was like how patients thought about polypharmacy. Um, click forward one more. This is an insulin needle. So like a lot of times we have these elderly patients on these therapies such as insulin that are pretty burdensome and maybe could be eliminated depending on the patient's individual medical condition. Click forward one more. This is a go lightly tub. So like thinking about screening, you know, like what are the benefits and burdens of different screenings that we're prescribing? And could we uh, eliminate some screenings based on our patient's healthcare conditions? Um, if you click forward one more, there's a calendar. Um, my thought, you know, one of the thoughts I had coming into this project with this patient was I was wondering if he just felt really overburdened by the number of appointments he had, just looking at his schedule. It was basically appointments, you know, like every week for like almost two years now. And I was wondering if that was a burden in and of itself. And then finally, if you click forward one more, there's a blood pressure log example. And one of the things that this study brought up that I thought was interesting was um, that a lot of patients feel pretty burdened with sort of self-management activities. So I think it feels very low effort for us to ask patients to do something like track their blood pressure at home or if they track their weight for heart failure or track their blood sugars for their diabetes. But depending on the patient's personality and kind of how much time they do or don't have to work on these activities, it can feel really super duper burdensome to them. Um, I'm wondering, Leah or Naya, um, or to me, any like thoughts on any of these? All right, that's fine. Um, pause. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to jump in there. Oh, yes, please do. No, I was just saying I was going to let anyone else participate. But um, I am actually just really curious to hear your thoughts because I, I don't have a good framework for this was what I was going to say. And I'm wondering if that's what others are thinking, too. Yeah, like what's burdensome and what's not. Um, I think fundamentally one of the takeaways I got from this project and this framework is like it's actually very hard to know from the outside what is going to be burdensome to patients. And there are some patterns of things that tend to feel burdensome, like screenings, like polypharmacy, like self-monitoring activities at home, like blood pressures or glucoses. You don't actually know until you talk to the patients about what they in particular find burdensome. So I think it kind of goes back to that earlier point that I think Timmy made about 
approaching it sort of with a blank slate and just really being curious and kind of investigating what does this patient find burdensome. So it's hard to know from the from the outside. So I think just asking open-ended questions about what parts of their healthcare are not working well for them is sort of the recommendation that um, I took away from this. All right, let's click forward one more. So for my patient, what he didn't like was needles or being cut open. So he, didn't, he really didn't want surgery, and that had been one of his initial, obviously, reasons why he declined surgery. And he also did not like being hospitalized. All right, and then click forward one more. So now we should be on the one thing. And we should be seeing bullet points on the screen. So basically the goal of this interview is to try to come up with a sort of like a goal statement so you and the patient come to together where you agree to focus on a particular bothersome symptom or helpful or bothersome care so they can achieve some sort of specific health goal. So for my patient, if we click forward to we'll see another speech bubble that pops up with my patient, and then we see that he wanted to gain weight and keep up his energy so he could help uh, his wife reunite with her children. All right, if we click forward one more, we'll see an after visit summary. Um, basically summarizing kind of what I took away from my conversation with the patient in the clinic, where we started metazapine, both for sort of mood, breath, and low mood concerns, as well as an appetite stimulant and helping sleep during the day and avoid sleeping, um, sorry, to help him sleep at night and avoid sleeping during the day. And I talked to his social worker to let her know that he wanted further sort of social work help. And then we decided to follow up closely since we brought up what he thought you can see that it's actually helpful and not for the of our mission that's here. All right, and then let's click forward again. So here we should see, so I'll put in the practice. This is just like a, a, a printout that I did and I was taking notes on paper during the visit. My goal in showing you this is basically just to show you that it actually, you know, I didn't write that much. It wasn't that crazy. And I sort of that I actually did this during a visit with a patient, which I don't know, I wasn't sure that it would be possible. And then if you click forward again, you should see interesting data. You click forward one more time, and there's a table that comes up. This is really interesting data from the original study population that basically shows the impact of putting this framework into action, where uh, the intervention group had this framework implemented, so the patient's already care intervening framework implemented, the control group that just done match group of patients who did not. And in intervention groups, you can see they stopped more medications, in particular cardiovascular medications. Then interestingly, like more psychotropic medications were added, so more medications addressing depression and anxiety. And they also had this interesting metric of consults avoided, where they were basically measuring the number of, like a decrease the number of uh, specialist visits. The intervention group also had fewer specialists for this, so it's more consults were avoided. Let's click forward one more. Um, so now we're seeing some information about where this intervention is tested. You know, the big drawback to this is it was testing like a really monolithic population in suburban Connecticut. And there was one smaller validation study done in Texas. So clearly, you don't know how this. So I think at my clinic at the VA, it seems pretty reasonable to try this. Um, but I think like depending on the patient population, kind of this approach may or may not be so successful. Um, but I think if you like a start to really grounded approach on what's most important to their patient, I would hope that it would still be useful in different uh, groups of folks. All right, let's click forward. So now we should be looking at templates. And then click forward one more time, and you'll see an epic template that pops up. So you can look under my start, start phrase as an EPIC, CPC for patient priorities care, and you can steal my smart phrase if you want to uh, try this with one of your patients that you maybe like are wondering kind of what you're doing in clinics. Then in CPRF, it's a little more clunky, um, but you can copy it from my templates or you can email me if you want a copy of this template. Um, and let's click forward one more time. Um, and I'm just wondering if anyone has any like, questions or thoughts about this framework in particular, or like putting this into practice in like an outpatient setting. This is Ananya. I just wanted to say that this is so helpful for us. Um, I really appreciate 
that you're giving us this framework and your smart phrase um, to address goals of care in the outpatient setting, because that is a place where I feel like completely unprepared. Um, and I just really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate everyone sticking through with all my terrible tech problems. Yeah, I thought this was really useful. And I thought it was something that I really didn't know how to do. And I feel like when you're on the inpatient side, you end up doing something in the mission, and you're like, dang, I really wish they'd address goals of care in the outpatient setting. And then the next day you're in clinic and you have someone on your schedule, but you have no idea kind of how to actually do it in a useful way. Or it feels very reduced like code status, which I think can be a really intimidating place to start, especially if you don't feel like you really know the patient that well, just diving into a code status conversation without any idea of what they're thinking about their healthcare. Any other thoughts or questions? Just some comments in the chat echoing Ananya's sentiment that they really like this and also thanking you for the smart phrase. You're welcome. And Sophie, just for a just for a time check in. So currently yeah. 1037. Um we initial so we do have a last talk starting at 1045. Yeah. So we've got about eight minutes. Um and our yeah. interns are gonna have to break good. off. Okay, perfect. Our interns off to um, yeah, thank you. I was going to ask you where we're at time. I think what we should do is actually we should totally skip the remap section of things. So I really just wanted to briefly introduce you to this. Okay. So hopefully you can remember it and Google it on your own. Um, I'm happy to send people the slides if they want to look for it. It's very brief. And if we have eight minutes left, left I would vote let's move to discussion for six minutes and then we can come back. And if people have anything they want to share from the discussion group, that's great. If not, they don't have to. Um, and then, sorry, I can't see the chat because I'm on my phone, but hopefully we can share the list of discussion questions and I would just ignore the inpatient ones. I'm sorry, I ran out of time with my tech problems to talk about that. Okay, great. And so the discussion questions are, I'm just gonna go pull those up. I will post them into the chat really quickly. Sorry guys, as I get Word document up here, hold on, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I will post these in. Um, I think that sounds like a good plan. Yeah. And then Ananya, I'm going to post the link as well to the, um, for folks. Uh, so interns, um, intern core conference is going to start at 1045. So um, you all can, let's see. Let me see. Yeah, I just put the link in the chat. Yeah. Oh, did you just throw it in there? Thank you. Oh, man. So helpful. Um, let me. I'm going to start with the first three questions that Sophie had. There's actually, I think, unfortunately, I forgot to send this out to you guys in advance because there is a um, picture with a with a graph. Um, let me see if I can just download this. If we want to maybe Javel just start getting folks into the breakout rooms. You said six minutes. Is that what I heard? Uh, yeah. And I, yeah. I think like no time. Well, with yeah. it being yeah, with it need... 40, why don't we just do five minutes and then we'll just have folks come back at um, 1045 for Dr. Coventry's talk and interns can go ahead and break off to ICC. Awesome. Great. I'm going to wait until Thank the interns leave and then recreate the breakout rooms once they leave. Okay. Sounds good. And as we do that, I'm going to try to. Um, yeah, apologies. I, I knew I was missing something. I didn't send the goals of care discussions out to folks beforehand. I'm going to actually, I think I can share a document in here. Can I? Oh, yeah, I can. I just go to, I'm going to just pop that in the chat. Da, 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 da. Okay. So I'm sending, so goals of care, Scott, you guys should see there's a document in there as well that um, includes these questions as well as one additional question. You may not have time for all of them and that's totally okay. Let's see. Okay, so any, I see a few interns still on here. Interns go ahead and break off to ICC. Uh, 
All right, I'm gonna open up the rooms. Give me five minutes. Thank you, Javel. Of course. I don't see our next person yet. Um, yeah. Dr. Winter, yeah, she's one of the psychiatry residents. And so I think she was probably just planning to join just for her part of the talk. Yeah. Thank you for helping us through all these tech things. It worked out, worked out okay. Yeah, it, it, technology, what are you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> what are you gonna do? I just see, I got this cool pop-up just now. I like all these updates Zoom is doing. It says that now, you know, you can project like a message to breakout rooms. Now I can like speak mm. into the breakout rooms. <laughs> There's a disembodied voice now. Yeah, it's like the voice from above. Oh man. Yeah, it's like interesting. <laughs> Probably not going to use that, but interesting. No, but it's there. <laughs> Yeah, I know that in, um, so when the chiefs have done the chief happy hours and we use gather, you can do that where you can like pop in and it's like your video, like you pop in to everybody. Cause the way, gather, I don't know if you, have you ever used gather before? I yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't either till this. It's kind of fun. Cause you like, you make a little, like, it's like, um, it almost looks like, like, a, like a retro video game kind of thing. And you like make a little, um, like avatar for yourself. And so then you can like walk around. And then based on who you're in proximity to is who like this is essentially like a video chat opens with. Oh, so, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So the way that um, the chiefs have made it is so there's like different rooms in this like virtual world for different discussions. So like if people want to talk about like living in Seattle or like, you know, having, you know, having kids in residency or other things like they can go to different topics. But then there's this like center stage where if somebody's standing on the center stage, their video gets broadcast to everyone. Um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty cute. It's, um, it's fun. Gather. I'll yeah. Gather. Yeah. I have never seen it in any other context, but that was what, um, I think maybe Linda found it last year. And so that's what they used for last year's, um, residency happy hours. And we decided to keep with it this year rather than just doing like zoom breakouts. Cause it's, it's just like, it's a little, it has that like little bit of novelty to it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it. Take your avatar and that's cute. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, so I'm just gonna see if um if Audrey pops in, I don't know if she is gonna like well, I guess we would see her. Yeah, we'll see her. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna go back to her. Thank mm -hmm. you. 